This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Today on the show, I I have an interesting guest, uh, slightly different for my listeners, but uh, gentleman's name is Ryan Holiday, and uh, Ryan is the director of marketing at American Peril. It's one of his one of his jobs. He's also a media strategist, and he's worked with clients like Tucker Max, Dove Charney, also at American Peril, the CEO, and uh, you know just a really interesting story. And the reason we're talking today primarily is because his, his new book comes out, Trust Me, I'm Lying, Confessions of a Media Manipulator. Ryan, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So, you know, I, I, and I told you in email, and, and not just because I've, I've met you and we've become friends a little bit. If you are involved in business, if you are an entrepreneur, if you're anybody that has a message, if you have to communicate with the public, if you don't understand the contents of what you've so carefully researched and written about in your book, I, I, as I told you, I think someone's a masochist. I, I, I don't know how you can not avoid what you've put in this book. But let me let me jump in and kind of let you set the foundation, because I, I really think if I'm reading you correctly, this all this really starts with the word blog. Yeah, it does. Basically, what what. The central premise of the book is that the, the sort of the blog online media cycle not only drives the offline cycle, but it sort of determines and uh, directs culture itself. And so uh, there's this famous journalist and he was like, he said this in the early 1900s. He said, like, look, America is a company or is a country governed by public opinion. And public opinion is governed by newspapers, which at the time was the dominant cultural medium. And so he's, he said, isn't it critical then that we understand what governs newspapers? The, the thinking being that what rules over newspapers basically rules over the entire country, determines what happens in the entire country. And I sat down in this book just to really determine what rules over the internet because that's what rules over us. Let me, let me throw an example out there, and I, there's a there's a ton in the book, so I'm definitely not giving away anything. But it was one that I related to. You know, I told you I was from the D.C. area. I'm currently in Southern California right now, but you know, I, a lot of conservative friends. And right. uh, you know, a, a couple of years ago, you know, I started hearing this name Tim Pawlenty. All of a sudden, it's everywhere in the press. And I think you've got a great story about how that name came to have such prominence. Yeah, there, it's it's interesting. I, I was just you know reading the New York Times, and there was this article, and they sort of accidentally gave it away. I don't think they really understood what was happening, but it, the New York Times was following a reporter at Politico who was covering Tim Pawlenty, and he was doing it before Tim Pawlenty uh, had declared his candidacy or was in any way intending to run for president. And so what what I noticed there, what strikes me is that. In the article, you can tell that the political reporter wants Palenti to be a candidate more seriously than Palenti wants to be a candidate. And I, I was, that struck me. And I thought, why is that? And, and what I realized is that like blogs have understood, and they're quite open about this, that when their traffic goes up during election cycles, and when you're a business who's taken investor funding and, and you sort of live and die by traffic, you can't sit around and wait for elections to come at the scheduled time. You sort of got to make them up. And what, what Politico is doing here, and Tim Pawlenty is a great example, was they essentially manufactured a candidate, almost against his will in some ways. They made him a candidate, which which was then easy for them to cover, get a lot of attention for. And then as soon as they were done with him, they got rid of him. And you, you saw this all throughout the Republican primary and the, and, and the cycle, which was it went Tim Pawlenty, or first it was, you know, Sarah Palin, then Tim Pawlenty, then uh, Newt Gingrich, then Herman Cain, then Newt Gingrich again. And all these people, I think the rest of America was sort of sitting back and going, who are these characters? These people are, are comical. Why are they, why are they being jammed down our throats? And the reason is because they play well on this internet media cycle. They are an endless supply of page views. And so the media creates these things, which then have real implications and consequences in our real lives. Well, let me let you go back and kind of really lay the predicate for the food chain 
almost. I think I'm using paraphrasing a little bit of your yeah. terminology. The food chain of how how the the story starts in 2012 and how it ends and how it moves along that chain. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess to, to lay the cycle out for people who don't understand is where do you think journalists get the stories that they cover? So let's say a reporter at the New York Times or a political reporter at the Washington Post or an editorial writer at the Chicago Tribune. Where are they getting their ideas? Are they out pounding the pavement or, you know, listening to gossip in bars? No, of course not. They're sitting at their computer reading less well-read blogs than their publications, but that are sort of influential or have a reputation for being first. So the Palenti cycle is a great example of someone getting coverage early on on a few influential but small political blogs, which then bigger political blogs picked up and start talking about. And then rumors become facts, become reality. And um, in, in his case, he just sort of traded up this chain from small blogs covering him to being chattered about, to doing the occasional television appearance, to commanding bigger crowds. And then once you're on television, you're commanding crowds, then the money starts pouring in. And then all of a sudden, you're a real candidate. And you have a real impact on that ele- on, on the election, except you're not actually you're, you're sort of being propped up by interested parties. And as soon as they're done with you, they get rid of you. And Herman Cain was a great example. Was the American public clamoring for the CEO of Godfather's Pizza to run for uh, to run for president? I don't think so. And the media sort of decided to suspend disbelief and make him a candidate. And I don't want to get too into politics because I don't really care, but. They suspended disbelief, made him a real candidate, and then when it was more in their interest to undermine him as a candidate, they were happy to trot out rumors. So it's like Politico, the site that start, starts talking about Palenti, ends up being the same site that breaks the story that takes down Herman Cain. And that's the cycle that I observe all the time for, for my clients and just sort of as a, as a student of this, of this sort of media world. Let me let me set something up about you. I want to let you get a little bit more into your background and okay. some of your experiences. I, I want to pass along some of my initial experience with you. You know, you are the guy that has basically. You say you're in your twenties. I think you actually could be seventy five, um, <laughs> not physically, but wisdom wise. Right. So you know, I've got here in front of me letters from a self made merchant to his son. You've got me reading meditations to Marcus Aurelius. Um, but I, I want to pass along because I, I think people are going to find this unusual. Some of your, and, and we'll go through this, this full uh, cycle of where you've come to today. But when I first met you, we didn't know each other. I didn't really know. I didn't know anything about you. And um, you didn't know anything about me. And, right. we, you know, we met at this uh, Tim Ferriss event. And I handed you, and I don't know if you recall this, but I handed you a copy of my film. And you didn't know anything about me. And you immediately turned it to the back and you start reading. And you just looked at me and you're like, we have to change this. Okay. Now, you didn't ask whether this is for sale, whether it's out in the public or not. You were just like, we have to change this. Now, I was not insulted at all because I I like the brutal honesty. I like when somebody just says, this is how it is. Let's make it better. And, I, and you know, that kind of really struck me about you. Now, getting into your book, and I, I think there's a full a full cycle of where you've come to today near the end of the book, but you are a pretty rough and tumble uh media manipulator at one point in time in your career. And, and maybe you could kind of lay out what that means and perhaps uh, the kind of brass knuckles that you've used in your career in the world of media manipulation. Yeah. So, I mean, what I was doing there, so what I specialize in is like, I, I phrase it like I get people the attention that they deserve because the reality of the, the cycle that we have is that it's not fair. Certain things uh, are more conducive to being spread on the media. They're more conducive to being talked about. They generate attention online better. And so there's all these people that do great work that they, they spend a lot of time on. Like I, I'm sure you, I, I mean, you spend a ton of time and a ton of your own money funding this amazing, um, documentary. And then maybe it doesn't, it's not seen by everyone that it deserves. And so what I sort of did, and, and I got this start working for, for authors who were sort of disrespected and kind of outside of the system, like up and coming people. And it was like, okay, if the system is going to shut us out, what rules does it play by that we could exploit? What frozen patterns does it sort of operate by that we can figure out and then anticipate and uh, manipulate? And so like when I see something like your thing, I say, 
like I'm sure this is the best this is this is a way that you wanted to communicate the 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 back copy of the DVD but like it doesn't work on the internet so what I've gotten really good at is internalizing these rules that I don't agree with that I don't think that's how it should be or even want it to be that way but I understand them and my job is to translate and communicate those rules to people and uh you know sort of the other direction to translate their materials to work in a world where those rules are um the the status quo so like you know someone someone spends a year of their life make, writing a book if they just think if they buy into this mass delusion that if you do great stuff the internet will discover it and it will be popular that you know you make a funny picture it'll make the front page of reddit that's the big big lie of the internet and i help people combat that lie we live in what's called an attention economy which means that attention is the most sort of precious threatened resource and i help people make sure that they win the fight for attention cuz someone's going to get it you just want it to be you right yeah absolutely why don't you talk about uh, it's kind of a, 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 a double edge here, but the yeah. notion the notion of gatekeepers as you've come to understand them and the idea, the DNA of a virus and how it spreads through these gatekeepers. Yeah. So it's like you have your thing, right? And the media is like, obviously, it's best if you can communicate directly with the people yourself. Like you have a large mailing list, you know, you have a blog. That's obviously the best way, but that's not that's only a small group of contained people. So if you want to reach the general public, how do you do that? Today, you do that through the media. The media stands between you and public opinion, like the guy, like the quote I was saying. They stand between you and, and the public. And so those, I, you have to, you have to view the media as essentially an, like the eye of a needle that you have to thread your content through if you want to make it. And so, um, those gatekeepers, are human beings and thus fallible and thus have certain patterns or, or rules that they operate by. And, and you want to figure out what those are and you want to, you want to make them work. So like the big, one of the big things I discovered is like, let's say you get written about by the New York times, right? The, the print issue of the New York times, you, your books have been reviewed there. They could have reviewed a hundred other books instead of your book, right? They chose you. And so for them to choose you is to do you a favor in short, right? Because they could have picked all these other people. Like, you know, like how, how, how rare is it to get your books reviewed by the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times? Like, it's really hard, right? So you're kind of like grateful that they do that. Now you flip it. How does the internet work? The economics of the internet are very different because that newspaper, for example, they only publish X amount of articles per day because there's only so much space in the newspaper or there's so much time in the 24 seven news cycle for Fox news to talk about you. But in the internet, they can publish an infinite amount of material and they get paid for each thing they add. Every new post is money in their pocket, right? So what I figured out is on the internet, when they write about you. They're not doing you a favor. You're doing them a favor because you're coming to them with something they can write about. You're giving them money. The New York Times doesn't make money when they review my book, but when Business Insider reviews my book and it does 5,000 page views, they just made money. So that was like, for instance, like... Well, what, what, Ryan, why don't you explain that a little bit more about the notion yeah. of page views? Because that was a... I mean, I kind of instinctively thought it through, but until you put it in a black and white, I'm like, wow, that's how this whole thing is governed? Yeah, so like blogs are paid... Like you see an advertisement on a blog, that blog is paid usually by the page view. So like I, I buy a online advertisements for most of my clients. Um, I spend a, a couple million dollars a year. And the way that works is you buy per thousand impressions. So maybe Huffington Post is one dollar per thousand impressions. So if you do an article, uh, and it does, you know, five thousand page views, you just made them five dollars, right? Like it, obviously the math is much higher, but so when they write about you and you get traffic, like your article is viewed, if they write about you and it's popular with the readers, you've just made them money. And more importantly, writers themselves are pay are compensated. Most bloggers, like a blogger for Gawker, let's say, 
not only is his boss, like the business itself, compensated by these advertisements, but the writer, his salary, what he's paid every month, is determined by how many pages he does. So basically, it turns the media into this one big, giant, page-view-hungry monster that needs things that will get it page views. And so instead of sitting back and doing the old media system, which is, you know, you call up a news reporter and you say, hey, I've got this great client. His name is Michael. He writes cool finance books. You should have him on the show. And he says, yeah, you know what? That seems newsworthy. I'm going to have him on the show. That's not how it works online. Online, they think, is having Michael on our web show or having Michael do an article for us or writing about him, is that going to get page views for us? Or is our traffic going to go up that day because we had him on the show? And if the answer is yes, then they will write about you or they will cover you in some way. And that's a totally different way of thinking about the media um, because the media is not so much a gatekeeper as it is a sort of a binary machine that thinks, is this good for us? And it, that self-interest is actually really easy to exploit. It's uh, it's become fairly brutal. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to read a small sentence here because I think it dovetails yeah. into what you said. And this is from a, uh, a journalist that you quote, Chris Hedges. It says, in an age of images and entertainment, in an age of instant emotional gratification, we neither seek or want honesty or reality. Reality is complicated. Reality is boring. We're incapable or unwilling to handle its confusion. And I, I think that probably takes it a step further that not only do those page views have to have to be there, but generally for those page views to occur, it has to be on the polar edges, right? It has to, yeah, it has to be provocative. Only, only certain kinds of content get page views. And it's it's we have the information now to determine what that kind of content is. And yes, uh, like for instance, the number one predictor of an article uh, making the most popular list for the New York Times Magazine is how angry that article makes the viewer. So you think about that. You're, a, you're someone who wants to be written about in the New York Times. You want to pitch a story that is going to make people angry because the New York Times has internalized that assumption as well. Um, I, I talk about the city of Detroit a lot in the book because it's a really great example. They, they did this cool um, examination of the types of pictures like we've all seen these crazy slideshows of like abandoned, decaying Detroit, right? And um, you know those those things do millions of page views on for Time Magazine and 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 the Atlantic and all the people who run those slideshows. And what they did when they were studying them is someone someone sat there and they were like, "Hey, what's missing from these photos?" And what they realized is not a single one of those incredibly viral photos of of Detroit ever had any people in them. They were they're all of abandoned buildings. Even though people live in those abandoned buildings, Detroit has a, has a horrible homeless population, has a horrible stray animal population. It's, it's got the largest squatters, uh, uh, amount of like squatters in the country, all, all kinds of shit, right? And so what they realize is that there's no people in those photos because seeing, seeing an abandoned church, for example, is kind of cool and eerie. Seeing an abandoned uh, church with a dead homeless guy out front is kind of sad, right? You don't want to see that. And so what Chris is, was talking about in that quote and, and what I talk about in the book is that that means that only a certain kind of content spreads on the internet. Like sadness, for instance, is a very unviral emotion. And Jonah Peretti, who owns BuzzFeed, he talks about this. He says, things that are sad don't spread well because nobody wants to pass along a bummer to one of their friends. And so what that means is we get a very distorted view of things. We only get the things that make us happy or angry or excited or laugh. We don't get the things that make us sad or uncomfortable or conflicted. Like only certain levers work online. And so everything you see online is designed around those levers because if it doesn't get page views, it's not worth doing. Let me, uh, let me throw out for you, uh, somebody you seem to respect in your book. Yeah. Uh, he's no longer with us. He was uh, an early uh, pioneer behind the, uh, the, the page views at the Drudge Report and Huffington Post. And uh, you, have a, you have a great quote in your book about Andrew Breitbart uh, feeding the dog. Why don't yeah. you kind of like lay out for folks as an example uh, about Breitbart and, uh, and kind of what he figured out? Yeah. So, I mean, I got to set the record straight. I don't, I have more of a begrudging respect for his, his efficacy at exploiting the system. I don't, 
I don't like what he does or did because like, I think it's messed up. But like, basically what Breitbart did was he understood that he saw needs in the current media system that he could, he could meet that would benefit him. So Andrew really early on, like people think that Andrew Breitbart was this sort of crazy right winger. And in reality, he wasn't. How, how could he be the founding employee of both the Drudge Report and the Huffington Post if he was some crazy ideologue? Because those people are at opposite ends of the spectrum. No, what he was really good at is understanding the media system. And like the, the quote in the book is he's like, you don't just throw a steak to a dog and then expect him to learn how to sit. No, you feed him little pieces over time. And then he, he learns to associate sitting with steak. And what he did was he would provide the media with these sort of sensational, crazy, interesting stories that were like, that even though they ended up being totally wrong, still got a lot of mileage for both him and the media. And then he would personally benefit from that. So like, take the Shirley Sherrod story, the, the woman in who's a, who's an employee in the Department of Agriculture who he accused of being a racist, right? In that famous video. Um, that, that turned out to be highly edited and she was actually the opposite of a racist. But, but whatever, what matters is that he put together this sort of pseudo piece of news that he posted it on his site and everyone was so desperate to get page views that they just repeated it and it became true and then she was fired and then when it turned out to be not true, the media got to discuss about how they got tricked. So it's kind of this weird perfect storm where like, the journalist's job is, is to almost sort of report on like stuff that's happening rather than report the truth. And, uh, the Shirley Sherrod story is a great example of someone planting something fake on the internet, it getting widely discussed both online and offline. And then it actually required President Obama to call her and apologize because she'd been, she'd been forced out of her job for, for something that she never said. And, uh, I, what I see happen there, I see happen on a smaller scale with my clients, with the stock market, with, with everything, um, because, because the cycle needs that stuff and it benefits from it. Well, you know, I gave you my example this morning in email. Yeah. We, we don't have to re-go into it, but uh, I mean, I could bring it up, but it, it was, uh, I'll just do it real quick. So yeah. back in 1990, I was, uh, I was involved in politics. I actually ran for candidate. I was a candidate in a small town outside deep Washington, D.C., uh, I was running against a guy who was 72. He'd been in office for 25 years. It was a machine. And the way the cycle went, the last media day before the election was on Thursday. That article would come out on a Monday, and the election was on a Tuesday. So they called me up on a Thursday, and some reporter, and she says, she says hey, did you hear about this, uh, this, uh, this hanky-panky scandal in town of Vienna government with the police and drinking and stuff? I didn't hear anything, but I was, like I told you, I was savvy enough not to say much. And I said, listen, I, I don't know anything about that. I mean, you know, there should be any bad behavior. Headline comes out the day before election, Covell supports sex scandal. You know, and you're just, you just, and I was reading your book and I was like, man, this is just, we've been living with this kind of attitude in our country for a long time. But I think what you correctly point out in your book is it's on steroids now. It, it, it is on steroids and it happens faster and the reporters more immediately gain from it, right? Like, like the, the reporter you showed me, it turns out now she's sort of an established journalist. So what she was just doing, she was screwing you over in order to sort of get her big break, right? Well, what if she'd also been paid for how many page views that story got? You bet that it would have been a lot. It, it would have been even crazier and it wouldn't have been the only time. I talk about a, a blogger in the book named Erin Carmone who used to write for Jezebel. She was personally responsible for fake scandals involving American apparel. She was the person who accused The Daily Show of being sexist. And then she also went after Judd Apatow for supposedly, you know, like having offensive female characters in her movies. All three of those instances are demonstrably untrue. But she, she did that because she benefited from it. Those stories combined did, I think, close to a million page views, which is, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in her pocket. And so like, for instance, like, you know, you're in the finance space. So you know that journalists shouldn't be writing about s stocks that they hold shares in, right? Because they would say things that about the thing that would change public opinion and make them money. Well, what if every story that bloggers wrote, wrote was a conflict of interest? That's what we have today because 
the way that they write that story has a direct connection to how much money they make about it. So let's say something is like kind of complicated but and boring. Is a journal, but a journalist has to write about it. Are they going to write a complicated, boring story, or are they going to change it and subtly redirect it so it's exciting and simple? And that happens every day. Well, you know, you make that you make the point. You, you said the blogs have really become our digital blood sport. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, and, and I, you know, and I think what what I see in reading your book, and this is why I think it's so important that that folks that are that are just involved in the economy, and I'm, I, I really think the book's for everyone. I, I, I mean, I I can see you. from a business owner standpoint, I can see why I need to to read it. But if even if you don't have a business and you just work for the man doing something. This book forces you to now be skeptical, to, to ask questions, to say, what's the motivation? What's going on here? Is this real? I mean, yeah, that- I, think, I think you need, you need to examine, I always say, examine uh, who, who is writing this and who's giving you this, who's giving you your information. What do they get out of it? You know, um, Cicero used to say this, he used to say, who benefits? Uh, there's a Latin word that I don't know how to pronounce, but it, you, you always ask who benefits. And when you can ask yourself that, it, it allows you to sort of step back and say, okay, here's why they're doing it this way. What sort of truth can I ex- extract from it? Or do I need to disregard the entire thing because it's just self-interested dribble? Yeah. You know, one of the, one of the things that I thought you, you, from my perspective, as an author who has seen my share of, uh, of criticism and praise, I, I thought you're, writing where you called it defining snark i just read i just read that i was like oh my gosh if i could have read this when my books first came out i would have just i would have emotionally seen how you're supposed to deal with this versus like you said you know if you read that if you read some crazy comment your your first your first inclination is to say i must respond but it's literally the worst thing you can do because the person that's writing the snark the person that's saying this nasty thing about you that's not even dealing with what perhaps you wrote about they're just no. going straight after you personally that literally it's almost like uh what's the phrase it, it's like the the the, uh, the velcro you stick to them they stick to you so the moment you respond it's all over yeah it's like or it's like jujitsu like the force that you exert to attack them actually just gets redirected back at you and you end up hurting yourself trying to defend yourself because what like for instance like i, I say this in the book you call someone a douchebag like if i call it i say you're, michael you're a douche what could you ha- you can't defend against that because if you were like i'm not a douche like that inherently makes you sound douchey right it's this sort of ideal intellectual position where people on the internet can say whatever they want and be as critical and mean and snarky as they want and no one can do anything to protect themselves from it. And everyone's a part of it because snark is so easy and it gets so much attention and it's fun to read. Like we all read snarky things and think that they're funny, except when they're directed at us. And I think I think that's that's the, the key point. And you know, perhaps, and I'm not trying to kind of pat myself on the back, but perhaps folks like myself, yourself, that have had a chance to see how the public eye works a little and perhaps have seen the uh, the cannon turn back maybe other folks are going to eventually at some point in time in their life going to start to understand how how bad something like snark is i mean culturally and we can get more we're going to get more into right. this because i think there is a great happy ending at your book from where you really sign it, sum things up but culturally this is a really bad thing it makes it impo- it makes good culture impossible like think about it who would want to be a politician today like who would want to enter the public sphere when like everyone is fake everyone is lying uh, you can get endlessly criticized. You can't defend yourself. Like, look at someone like Mitt Romney, right? Like, I'm not going to vote for the guy, but like, doesn't it kind of, like, we sit there and we, we tell people we want them to be authentic and real, right? Well, Mitt Romney is a rich white guy with born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Does that make him a bad person? No, we've had plenty of good presidents who were that way. So FDR was that way, right? Do we need him to pretend to be something else because we can't accept people for who they are? Like, I would rather Mitt Romney stand up and go like, look, I'm a multimillionaire. I'm a successful businessman. That's why you should vote for me for president. Instead, he has to pretend to be like an, a man of the people. And why does he have to do that? Because we criticize whatever people are 
because that's easy. So it's like he's a rich white guy. You know, we make fun of him for being a rich white guy. He's Sarah Palin, who's just, you know, a hick. Then we make fun of her for being a hick. And it's like, who, who is it okay to be? And the answer in the world of snark is no one. Everyone is uh, susceptible to being mocked endlessly, except the people who are doing the mocking, because they've set the system up in a way where they are sort of uh, untouchable. Well, and they're untouchable because a lot of them are anonymous. Exactly, exactly. And they, and they somehow, it's like you're out there signing your name to your work, and that somehow makes you less... Like that somehow makes you more of a target and easier to make fun of than the person who is sitting behind a computer screen under a student in. It's like whatever you do counts against you. That's the insidious nature of the system. You know, as you talk about the system, you, I, we're not going to go too much into politics here, but I was thinking about the perfect political candidate in the world that right. you're describing is, and I'm not trying to make this, you could probably find this candidate yeah. on the right or the left, but Trump is the perfect candidate because he's Teflon. He like right. literally, the, the controversy and the snark comes into him and goes back out 500 miles an hour faster. And it fuels him, right? Like he, as a, he kind of ran, you know, he's kind of involved in this election. Everyone laughed at him, but you know what? He's more famous than he was a year ago. And that's what he wanted. Like, uh, like I use the example of the Jersey Shore. What could you say about the Jersey Shore that would delegitimize them, that would hurt them? Nothing. nothing. <laughs> because they have nothing to lose, right? Like the alternative for them is obscurity. So in, in for their aim of becoming famous for being famous, everything you say counts for them rather than against them. You know, I, I, gotta, I want to let you, we've, we've kind of uh, followed a certain narrative here, but I want you to go back in time because there was something yeah. I just thought about that I want people to understand that even though you, this is, I kind of describe this as kind of a, a serious business book slash history book, but I want people, as you're giving this very cogent analysis of how you've seen things and what you've experienced, go back to the example of the billboards and the stickers and kind of lay that out so people understand at what level you were working when you got involved and how you saw things. And obviously they can see the progression now in our conversation, but paint a picture for them uh, that they can understand maybe something that you might've done that back in the day. Yeah. So I was working for this one. He's a number one New York times bestselling author and his book had just been turned into a major motion picture. And so uh, for the ad campaign for the movie, it, w- it was still a- it was still an independent movie. I think it had a budget of about $8 million. And we had, you know, just a few hundred thousand dollars of marketing budget. And advertising is really expensive. So what I thought was, I thought, okay, so we can't have all the traditional press. What if we just got press, period? How could we get them to talk about us rather than paying for ads for people to see? So what I thought is, okay, let's make this one of those movies that everyone's boycotting and protesting. So like, it's a long story, but so we set that all up. It's this controversial movie. It's being, it's being uh, editorialized and people are boycotting. And, uh, and we'd spent about $20,000 on ads in Los Angeles and no one was really talking about them. They were in a crappy place. Like we got the best thing that we could afford, but it wasn't enough. So I thought like, how could I make this into a news story? And I was like, and it hit me. What I decided to do was pretend that I was someone who was boycotting the movie and I would vandalize my own billboards. Like, you know, it's our money. We put it up there. We spent $20,000 and I, I took the step of defacing my own billboards. And we put this, this sticker on there that basically accused uh, the author of being a rapist, you know, in a sort of a funny snarky way. And, um, and then what I did was I took pictures of it and, and then, and so, so it, I could have just vandalized it and hoped that someone in the media would write about it, but that's a risk I wasn't willing to take. So what I did was I vandalized it. Then I got back in my car and I drove by and I took a picture with my cell phone as though I was just like a passerby who just saw this funny thing. And I sent it as an anonymous tip to two big blogs in the Los Angeles area and said, you know, you guys have probably seen this already because everyone's talking about it, but you've got to check out this hilarious uh, billboard that got vandalized or this, the, the hilarious way that they vandalized this billboard. Like I was again, making him the bad guy that everyone hated. And you know, they instantly bit, they wrote two big stories on it. 
And then it became this thing that people were, were vandalizing these billboards. And in New York City, a group of 16 feminists got together, not knowing that me doing it was fake, and uh, called the Village Voice out to follow them and had a huge citywide campaign of vandalizing the billboards. And so this fake thing that I did, that I leaked to one small blog, became a national news story. Uh, and eventually, like the city of Chicago actually... Um, banned our advertisements from that city in response to the the backlash, which was completely fake. Now, I'm not saying every last piece of news is done with such creativity, right. but if you can imagine, if you can imagine what Ryan just described, and then think about it when you open up any blog, any newspaper, and start to really say, what's the backstory? What's right. the real story? Like, I was just doing that. I mean, I was getting paid, but I was just doing that to help out a friend whose, whose project I agreed with, right? You know, there's billions of dollars at stake for companies like BP or Shell or, you know, there's international influence and power at stake in presidential elections. If it's so easy for me to do to help out a friend, what do you think these people who whose entire lives or fortunes are at stake are going to do with the news. They're not going to fuck around. They're not going to le they're not going to say, "You know what? That sounds like a bridge too far for us." They're going to take it even further than I did, and they do. Well, I th I think back to a great example in my world in the fall of 2008, uh and I have a feeling honestly almost any president would have said this because they were all probably be giving giving cue cards, but at the time President Bush came out and said in the middle of the crisis, he said, you know, I have to suspend capitalism to save capitalism. Now, right. I still don't know what the backstory is behind that, but I'll guarantee you it wasn't what it sounded like in the moment of that news conference. You know, it's that kind yeah. of getting people to see one step behind and realize the manipulation that's going on. Or, I mean, think about these people that trade stocks on information, right? Like day traders and such. That's so dangerous when all your information is suspect. I mean, they've caught people, like they know, like, it, it wouldn't seem like it, but like messages in Yahoo Finance move the market because people are looking for any information, any edge. These day traders are. And so there was this guy who would post fake press releases on Yahoo Finance. He'd say like, I just picked this up off uh, the street.com or I just picked this up off, off the wire. It looks like Microsoft is going to buy this website. And then when the stock would, like when the penny stock would go from, you know, five cents to 10 cents, he'd fucking clean up. And uh, because it only takes when when you're at such an influential core of uh, and it's such a small pool, and your actions can have such an outsized effect. I mean, who's not going to do that? I mean, you have the CEO of Whole Foods responding to messages on, on Yahoo Finance, you can't tell me that that that's not that there aren't a 100 other CEOs out there doing it uh, today, just covering their tracks a little bit better. You know, it's funny. We, we talked offline and I told you that you might not have thought of it clearly when you were doing your book, yeah. but you made the comment in your book. You said with all the, the information that's flowing out there, pseudo news, fake news, real news, whatever, that, that literally you're almost better off taking the net position of all news in the form of the economist once a week. And I told you, I was like, my gosh, that's almost the perfect way of thinking for the for the type of trading that I write about, which is literally just wait to the end of the week and, and work with one data point. Yeah, no, uh, I talk about the, there's this trend in the news and they call it iterative news. And that's or a better word for it might be real time journalism. And that's where journalists are pressured to essentially write the story publicly as it's happening. So it's like, like they're writing the story live in front of everyone, not like getting the information, sorting it, verifying it, and then putting out a final position once they feel like they've got a good handle on it. Instead, they're just blowing shit out, right? And so, like, a great example of um, uh, of this is a couple weeks, or actually this happened yesterday. So initially, uh, dig.com was announced uh, on a blog to have sold for $500,000, right? Um, and that was that's, you know, huge news because... Um, it turns out, or that's huge news because Dig is, you know, a, a huge influential website that had raised, you know, millions and millions of dollars of funding. That's a big collapse. Well, it turns out, so they published this story, you know, yesterday morning. By afternoon, it turned out that the $500,000 number was totally wrong. 
In fact, just like the domain name had sold for 500,000, but the total acquisition of all the parts was like $16 million, right? There's a big difference between $500,000 and $16 million. Let's say that that was like a, uh, someone had a big position or that was like a publicly traded company in some way. Like, if you had made a trade based on this $500,000 number, which it turns out was not verified and not vetted by anyone, you would have lost your shirt when it turned out to be, you know, wrong by a factor of 10 or whatever. So what, what I see people like, and the reason that happens, let me back up. The reason that happens is you might think that the site that broke the $500,000 number was embarrassed for being wrong, but that's actually not the, not the case. So they got the $500,000 number, which was sensational and got a lot of traffic, right? So everyone thought that was the case. Now, when it turns out they were wrong, the site gets to publish a second story about how they were wrong and how the number's actually much higher. And that's a second surprise. So instead of getting one good story, they got two crazy, super interesting stories. So it actually works out better for them to be wrong. It works out better for the publisher, but worse for the reader. And so let's say you're a stock trader and you're, do you really want to make decisions with your money on information where the people are incentivized to be wrong? I don't. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, uh, that's scary. It's nuts. The whole thing is nuts. I want to, I'm going to bring you close to the end though, on terms of your thinking. Cause I think we, okay. you, I'm sure there's some people out there that are thinking, Oh my gosh, this guy, Ryan, I don't like this guy at all. He's, right. he's been doing bad things for parts of his career. And you freely admit that. But I, I think there's, there's some fantastic lessons in here. And I think you make the point. You're like, Hey, look, judge me if you want, but this is the truth. And, right. and I, there's no doubt in my mind, I've had enough experiences to know this is 100% gospel. There is something that I really found interesting in your book, page, I think it's 218, and you talk about the news funnel. The news funnel. Yeah. And I, I want to just read one quick sentence, and then I'll let you kind of elaborate okay. on what it is. But, you know, a mechanism for systematically limiting the information seen by the public. And, I mean, yeah. wow, why don't you explain the news funnel from your perspective? So, so basically, and I'm not sure where I got this, but it, but it's very much rooted in, in, in the sociological, uh, study of the news. But basically, it's like, think, think of the news, right? So what it, let's, let's begin at the, at the, at the beginning. First, there's everything that happens in the world, you know, and then there's everything that journalists learn about. Then after that, there's sort of everything that journalists decide to write about. Then there's everything that gets published. And then ultimately, there's everything that the public reads. So think of that as a funnel where each one of those things is smaller than the one that came before it. There's everything that happens, and then way down at the bottom, in a much smaller way, there's everything that gets published on the news. So essentially, the media is a way of filtering out certain types of information. There's everything that happens. There, you know, there's everything we want to know about, and there's everything that gets published, and then there's everything that we ultimately, you know, by chance end up seeing. And so what I realized is that the media is not this way of informing us so much as it is about giving us a small fraction of the information that we might need to make decisions. And when you realize that their interests are not necessarily aligned with yours, uh, it sort of opens your eyes to how you become an informed, intelligent person. And the media is not someone that you can really lean on. And I, I know people are going to balk a little bit at some of my tactics and they're going to say, how could you do that? Th those things? I'm not saying that you should do them. I mean, I don't do them anymore either. But what I'm saying is that these things are happening right now. And if you don't defend, you don't have to do them, but you better defend yourself against them because if you don't, they're going to wreck you just as much as you could profit from them if you were doing them. And uh, it's like, if you don't know the rules, then you're going to get wrecked by the rules uh, because you're going to unintendedly, viol un unintendedly violate them. And, and that, that's, that, that's, exact, that's why everyone, that's why this is just a must read in terms of getting people to, and look, I, I say in a must read, if I, if I didn't meet you, if somebody else had written this, if somebody else had kind of perhaps maybe beat you to the punch and put this, this, this expose out there, this great kind of business historical read, I would say, read it. 
I, I do want to read one thing real quick because I think this gives a little bit of flavor of okay. of your uh, your personality. Our knowledge and our understanding is is the final empty hollow shell. What we think we know turns out to be based on nothing or worse than nothing, misdirection and embellishment. Our facts aren't fact. They are opinions dressed up like facts. Our opinions aren't opinions. They're emotions that feel like opinions. Our information isn't information. It just It's just hastily assembled symbols. There is no way this is a good thing, no matter how much I gained from it personally. Yeah, um, and that that was sort of ultimately the 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 thing that drove me to write this book. I, I was just talking to Drew Curtis today. He's the founder of Fark.com, which is a really influential news site. We were having this conversation about all the stuff that you and I are talking about now, and and I I I was like, what's funny to me, Drew, is that everyone in the media is currently having this conversation. They all know that the manipulations that I'm talking about, that you're talking about, happen, and they don't like it, and they wish that it wasn't the case. But then if, if someone on the inside is going to turn around and tell the public that this is all going on, that's when they close ranks and deny it because then, then their way of profiting from that is suddenly threatened. It's like everyone will complain and it's like an open secret, but they don't want it. They don't want the public to know because if the public knows, they might do something about it. And so what I wanted to do in this book was say like, look, my identity is not tied up in this. My livelihood is not tied up into this. Like I, I, I have my own, I have my own way of, of making my, my way in the world. I'm going to pull back the curtain and show everyone what's going on. It's like, I'll show you how the sausage is made. And then it's up to you whether you want to keep eating it or not. It's a cautionary tale. And I, you know, I, I, I read it and I say to myself, there's a, there's a couple big picture things that I see going on in society right now today. Uh, number one for me is I think technology is arbing away, arbitraging away the need for human capital. Yeah. But after reading your book, I, I, there's, there's, this is like another parallel type event that's taking place. And I, the end result, uh, I, I know you theorized to some degree in the book on how perhaps a change could take place. I'm a very optimistic person for myself, my family, my friends. Uh, but I don't see how this ship turns. It, it, and you make you make the example in your book. You say, "Look, you you know, there's going to be somebody out there that's going to think my book is an instruction, you know, instructional right. manual. But really, uh, you, you're going to end up being burned if you go that direction." Yeah, totally. I, I guess the, so. The the myth is like information is very important, obviously, right? And then we turn around and tell the media that we're willing to pay zero dollars for it from them. Like that's, that's, that's essentially our stance now. We go, information is very valuable and we need it right away, right now, and it better be good. Also, give it to me for free. And that is just a preposterous position. So I think if, if I had to predict one trend, I would say that the new digital divide is not going to be between like, you know, people who have access to the internet and people who don't, because everyone's going to have access to the internet, but it's who's going to be skilled and fluent enough to have access to high quality information and be willing to invest in it. And then there's going to be these other people who are dealing with the crap that I talk about in the book that's deliberately distorted and exaggerated and deceives them. And, and the difference between the rich and the poor is going to be their ability to access quality, reliable information. And I think, you know, services like you provide, that's not a free service for a reason because the alternative is all this shit out there. And I, I think, People are going to have to accept that, for instance, you can't reduce your news down to a 140 character tweet and not expect it to get a lot shittier. You know what? What? And this is kind of a big picture question for you, too. So we've talked about the manipulators. Yeah. The, the manipulation that goes on. What is the responsibility of the individual, the consumer? And, and what is the psychological profile of the consumer that, that somehow in the last generation we've shifted to where this kind of fast food kind of stuff that that maybe we deep down in our gut know isn't good for us, just like McDonald's every day, right. that we still consume it and we still eat it. And we don't see it's like we're on a, it's like we're on that I, the old Pink Floyd uh, video for another brick in the wall part two and the, and the kids are on the conveyor belt falling into the sausage grinder and right. I, I, w what's going on with the the end user consumer psychologically? What do you see? I mean, some people want to blame the consumers for this stuff. I think up until now, 
it's been hard to hold them very accountable because they didn't know that all all this machinery was going on behind like they didn't know about all the stuff behind the scenes what i wanted to do in the book was lay it all out and say this is exactly how it works and i'm telling you this as an uninterested person who is not even uninterested i'm actually being harmed by telling you this like it's hurting my my prospects at doing what i do but i'm going to give you this information and now that it's out there then i think the the public can sort of be held responsible but right now when everyone is pretending that they're doing good journalism but really doing very bad journalism how is the public supposed to know that what they're getting is unhealthy and bad for them it'd be like if mcdonald's like this is we're, i think we're looking at mcdonald's pre you know uh a good understanding of nutrition uh pre supersize me pre you know having to put your calorie count on the menu all that kind of stuff like when people didn't know because they were being deliberately deceived i don't really want to hold them responsible but you know the reaction to this book could very much be well so i like my celebrity slideshows and if that's the case then i guess uh so be it but i don't think that's going to be the case my re- my guess is that the public will not react well to hearing that basically all the news they get is deliberately manipulated to make them do and act a certain way. Well, you know, there's a simple there's a simple word out there that I think pro- perhaps and maybe this is one of the reasons somehow or another we both connected to have a conversation and strike up a friendship. I, I think ultimately most people, most good people, and maybe it gets blurred by as we talk about some of the manipulation, but I think most people want to find the truth. Yeah. They want to know what the truth is. And I mean, I think that's what's driving you. Totally. I think, I think that's what people want. And for basically in the history of the, the profession, the draw, the job of the journalist has been to get the truth for the reader. And with the advent of the economics of internet news, that equation has changed. The job of the journalist is no longer primarily about truth and we either need to update our assumptions about what we read or we need to change those assumptions and incentives. Yeah, I I'm not as I'm not as optimistic as you. I mean, this is a fantastic I mean, for me, your book was like, oh wow, this is the stuff that I've kind of seen bits and pieces of, but I've never kind of put it into a, a complete narrative in my in my own and to and to really see behind the scenes and say, oh my gosh, this is even worse than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's that's the thing is like I thought people were going to accuse me of exaggerating and so far the reaction from like bloggers and and public figures and writers and authors and stuff it's all been like it may be it's worse than you say. It's here's here's 10 other things that you should have added that make it even worse and it's like oh my god, what have I what have I uncovered? Well, if you know how the internet works, if you've if you've run a, a blog or a little business or something, if you know how the internet works, then you know that the words that are in this book are accurate. It, 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 you know how this. It, it's just kind of like a lot of people probably never would have thought to be as creative as you were in your younger years to take advantage of the system. They <laughs> might have, they might have drawn a line and said, "I'm not going to step across that line." Now you right. you ran across their line down the street for about another hundred miles. <laughs> but, but you, you know, you do, you do make some fantastic points at the end. And I think it's a, a it's just a, it's a really, really interesting book. I think for me though, too, the one thing that I don't know how we're going to get around re- regardless of your book is, and, and this is kind of a comment from your, from your text, but it's, it's the, the drowning in information, you know, and it leads totally. to, it leads to an endless blur. Like, how do you, how do you find meaning in that blur? And the blur is not going to stop. No, no, it's going to get worse. And, and I think people need to get a lot better at asking themselves, what could I conceivably do with this information? And if the answer is nothing, do not commit it to memory. Don't spend your precious time reading it. You know, what am I going to do with these, with these propo- like, it's one thing to like football. It's another thing to watch Sports Center and get an endless amount of stats every day that you cannot do anything with. It's one thing to trade stocks. It's another thing to be a CNBC junkie. You know, what are you going to do with all this information? What can you honestly do about the, the European financial crisis? The answer is nothing. Like, save your life, man. Like, save, save your limited bandwidth 
for things that you can affect and have meaning for you. Let me let me throw one last question into your wheelhouse because yeah. I think as you say that, um, I, I think there's a way that you can tell people from your perspective on how to perhaps get there. And and you've done it with me on on two texts, which are some of the books from the ancients. And yeah. and why don't you make the case for how you have come to respect so many of these works from 2000 years ago and why they have uh, driven a lot of your development? Well, I think, so there's this thing called the survivorship bias, which I, I'm sure you know very well. Um, I think you can kind of use it to your advantage, right? What are the books that have stood the test of time? Like this, you know, a book comes out tomorrow, my book comes out or whatever. It may become a classic, it may not, right? But so you're kind of taking a risk there uh, when you're buying new things. And and obviously now I'm recommending people don't buy my book, so that's probably stupid. But uh, you're, you know, you're, you're, it could be, it could stay on the test of time or in six months it could turn out to be totally like uh, made irrelevant by the course of events. Or you can find these books that have sort of worked cross-culturally, cross, uh, you know, generationally. They've worked in different societies. They Books that have really lasted. And the reason they've lasted, I think, is because they speak to some sort of deeper truth or deeper reality or deeper, deeper fact of life that, um, that a new thing might, that news might not do. So like, that's why I felt like, for instance, I love uh, the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. Why? That was a book never intended for publication. He was writing a book for himself. He was writing notes for himself that someone took after his death and turned it into a book. You know, letters from a self-made merchant to his son that you and I were talking about. That book was written advice from a father to his son. So it's sort of, he's not writing to appeal to an audience. He's trying to get to the truth, like you were saying, and that's much more reliable. And the fact that he did it a hundred years ago, and it's still mostly true, to me is a safer bet than reading some book by Jim Cramer that was written today that, you know, is probably or very likely could turn out to be just garbage. Well, I, you know, I think it's a, it's a, nice, a nice ending to our conversation here because I think you have... Uh, I know you want lots of people to read your book, and a lot of people have given some great comments about it so far. But I have a feeling the way this is written, you're kind of like, "Hey, take me or leave me." But you know, I'm still going to wake up tomorrow and be fine. But this is how it is from my perspective: take me or leave me. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I was going for. It, it means a lot to me that you picked that up. Listen, uh, what's what's the best way for folks to find you, Ryan, and when can they grab the book? Yeah, so the book is out Thursday, January 19th. Um, it'll be in bookstores everywhere. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Um, and then on my site, you can find me at ryanholiday.net. And there I actually, I do like a, re a newsletter every month of like reading recommendations. And I try to look at sort of undiscovered books that I think have stood the test of time that have some sort of unique or interesting perspective on things. So if people are looking for uh, books like the ones you and I are talking about, I, I've recommended both the books that, that you just mentioned on there uh, many, many times. Yeah, be forewarned, if you stop, start following Ryan's reading list, you probably are not going to be doing much else with your life because <laughs> the man is reading a few books, to say the least. Um, but uh, anyway, say, Ryan, it was great. We'll talk soon. And uh, thanks for the insights. I think my audience uh, will definitely appreciate your perspective. Well, cool, man. Thanks a lot. It's been an honor to, to talk to you all. Take care. Just a quick addendum after our conversation. I want everyone to make sure that they heard the right date on Ryan's book. It is July 19th, 2012. So uh, that is when the book will be available. Um, grab it on Amazon. It's probably the easiest for you. And his website is ryanholiday.net. Um, so take a peek. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.